in there. All right, let's get it started. <clears throat> So, um, on the first three chapters, we talked about the, um, the instruction set. I mean, uh, how we're going to do routines, how we're going to do recursions, and so on. In, in, the, in chapter four and five, we try to, uh, you know, build a very small scale uh, processor that provides some of those instructions, such as addition, division, not even division, addition and uh, subtraction, perhaps. And you, you, you're going to see how you're going to build a logical design out of what you want to get from um, a small processor. So just have a recap. Um, we talked about the CPU performance factor, okay, that comes from the, the number of instructions, so instruction counts. And the instruction counts were determined by, determined by the ISA and the compiler. So these two <laughs> were factored in to the number of instructions you're having to run. And CPI and cycle time were also determined by CPU hardware, right? So in this chapter, we're going to talk about uh, two different versions of uh, RISC V implementation. At first, at first, we're going to have a, simpli a simplified version. And also, we're going to go forward with a, with a more realistic pipeline version, OK? Some subset of the instructions will be implemented there, such as load, store, add, and branches. Okay, so before we start working on that, let's just have a quick um, review of the instruction execution in general, right? For every instruction, um, two identical steps need to be done. Okay, first of all, uh, we need to send the program counter to the memory that contains the code and fetch the instructions from that memory, okay? So that's what the first part referred to. So we need to fetch the instruction that needs to be executed, okay? Second, read one or two registers, depending on the instruction, if it's load or uh, other things, using field of the instructions that we just fetched above, right? For instance, for load instructions, we need only to read one uh, from one register because uh, because we're loading. For other other cases, we, we need two, right? But from in general, for most other instructions, we require to have two registers. So after we fetch the instructions, we need to read from those registers. So these two are two identical steps in every instruction execution, right? And then after finishing that, the way we update the program counter or the PC here is with the target address or the PC plus four, which goes to the next uh, instruction. So this is in byte. All right. So that's a high level overview of an execution of any sort of uh, instructions. Let's see in, in a very high level how we're going to define a very small scale CPU that processes these. Okay, so starting from left to right, we have we have the PC here, which was the program counter. Let me see if I can find this here. Okay. So. As you see here, those registers are the ones that we already talked about in the previous chapters. So the, the processors in, in, in the RISC V uh, instance, we have 32 general purpose registers, right? So they are stored in a structure called a register file, OK? Um, so a, a register file is uh, a, a collection of registers uh, for which any register can be read, write, or written. We just have to specify the number for that. In addition to that register files that contains all those, for instance, 32 registers in RISC V, right, we need to have an ALU to operate on the values read from the registers, right? And then we're going to decide 
what, what we're going to do with those values that we read. Okay, are, are we going to add them? Are we going to just compare them? What needs to be done? For instance, if you re recall from the instructions that we had in chapter 2 and 3, the R format <coughs> instructions, right? Um, so they needed to have three registers, uh, three registers operand, right? So we will need to read two data word from the register file and write one data word into the register file for each instruction, okay? So now for each of those registers, um, we need an input to the register that specifies the, the, the spe uh, specific register number that needs to be uh, worked on, right? That, the, that, that will carry out that uh, value of, of, of the, um, you know, thing that either it was brought from memory or we want to store something to memory, okay? And for some of those registers, which are called a, um, a write register, we need to, we can write on those. So to write a data word, we will need two inputs. One to specify the, the register number to be written, and one to supply the data. So that's why we have one for the data, and one to just by the, the, the register number. <coughs> okay? So that's for that up until here. Um, the register file always outputs the contents um, that, that we have read, okay? So these are the outputs. But for the specific case of write, if the register was a write register, we need another control that controls the, the, the write control signals. So we, we see another example in the, in the next slide with that specific case that controls how we're gonna, con uh, how, how we're gonna write on that at what specific time. We call this in, um, in most of the processors, uh, either at edge of the clock, right? or somewhere in the middle of that clock. So we talk about that convention as well. We need to make sure in a synchronous system at what step of the clock of the CPU we want to write so that uh, nothing is messed up when we, when we write or read. We talk about it in, a, in, in, in two or three um, slides. All right. So there's an issue with this paradigm that we start with PC and then we, we we fetch the instructions, we, we use the registers and the data, and then we do something with that, and then we store it back to memory. These lines that are overlapping each other, right? They can't just be overflown with data on top of each other. These are like the, the buses you have, the path that you just transfer data, right? It should go one by one. It's, you, they can't, you can't just miss them, uh, mix them all at once. So. In order to be able to take use of that one at a time per instructions, we need something that in uh, computer architecture we call it multiplexer, okay? Or in another word, we call it a data selector. It, it just simply selects which lane of the data we need to read and write to, okay? So if you add those to this graph, it's gonna be this, right? So where you have a multiple joint such as here, or here, or here. So you need something here that selects the data that comes in from each of the lane, right? We call it a multiplexer, or simply a data selector. Any questions up to now? All right. So now, again, all instructions are, are gonna start by uh, using the program counter to supply the instruction address, okay? Um, so after we supply the instruction address, we're going to have the instruction memory. So we, uh, we will see what we're going to do with, with the next instruction that was uh, set in the PC. Okay. So once the register operand have been fetched okay, from this pool of register files, uh, they can be operated to compute a memory address. Okay. 
So now we have to decide in what part of the memory we need to take values from. If it's a load uh, or, or it's a store, all right? Or it's just an arithmetic result for um, an uh, integer, perhaps uh, arithmetic instructions, okay? Or, or perhaps it was just an branch not equal or, or, or a sort of a branch thing that you need to, to, to check something, an equality check uh, or some sort of. In general, if we classify this, um, the different things that we can do with those register files, one is um, if the instruction is an arithmetic logic instruction, okay? We do logic with that. So the result from the ALU must be written into a register. So we need to use ALU and the results must be come back into a register. So that's one of the instructions. Number two, it's if the operation was a load or a store, okay? So either we load something from memory, a value, or a storing something from register to the memory, okay? The third one is a branches, so branches like instructions, that they need to use ALU here. The output of the ALU is going to determine if we want to come back or if, or if you want to just exit that to the next instruction, okay? And as I mentioned, all these thick lines are representing your, your buses. We call it bus, which just uh, simply consists of multiple lanes of signals, okay? Depending on the, the size of the bus. All right, so now that we know that we needed multiplexers and why we need uh, that PC instruction memory towards registers and ALU and data memory, let's just gradually add the, the control that actually controls the whole flow. So we replace those those joints here, right, with multiplexer, we call it MUX. So here we have three multiplexer, one on top, one here, and one here, okay? So think about a multiplexer such as a data selector. So just you have like four sources of data, okay? And here it needs to output one. So there should be a signal that points, that tells this module that, okay, select this, the second one, or select select this, the fourth one, okay? So normally there is there are two signals from the bottom side, depending on the input signal. For instance, we have four signals, so we need two other in order to select the four here. So say if, the, if this was zero, one, it's gonna, the output understands that it needs to read the second signal, right? If it was one zero, it understands that it needs to read the third one because one zero stands for third one. If it was one one, you know, the data selector will select the, the fourth one, okay, out of these four. So it's just a way to select data, okay, the multiplexer in, in, uh, in a very high level. All right, so let's talk about this top multiplexer. Right? It needs to select between the add, the output of the add, or the or the the previously generated program counter, right? Or the output of the other add that comes from this. So it needs to select one of them and output that. So this top multiplexer controls what value represents the, the PC, right? So either the output would be a PC plus four or it would be an address of a branch, right? So either we just carry on executing the program, plus four, plus four, plus four in the program counter, or somewhere along the program we were branching somewhere else, so we need to take that address as the next one. So, um, as I mentioned, the multiplexer is simply a data selector, right? So it controls uh, by the gate that ends together the zero output 
and the ALU and a control signal that indicates the instruction was either a branch or not. Okay, so this middle multiplexer here, the output of these returns, right, to register file, is actually used to, to guide the output of the, the ALU, right? Because the ALU comes here and it outputs it back to the uh, register file. In case, so when, when does this happen? In case that uh, we were just actually doing an arithmetic function, okay? And we needed the output to come back to the register uh, file. Or, the other way that comes back, this, this line, so we know this line is for the output of the LAU. This line comes back whenever we do, uh, in case of a load, right? We need to load something, uh, and, it's, and it needs to access the output of the data memory. Okay? Is it clear why, why we have those two lines? So one for the output of the ALU, on the case of arithmetic function, or the other one in, in the case of load, right? So these two are getting fed into this multiplexer, and it decides which of them goes back to the register file. Okay? Is it clear? Are you here? So we talked about these two multiplexer and what's going to be their input and output. So let's talk about the third one, which is the, the bottom one here, right? The bottom one, um, we actually used to, um, you know, determine whether the, the second ALU here getting input from the register or not. So that's, that's the first one, you know, that comes there. For sure, it would be an arithmetic or, or a logical instruction, right? Or a branch, could be a branch. Or from the, the offset field, um, when you read an instruction, right? Could be a load or a store. Comes from there. All right, so that's the reason we have these three multiplexers, because we, we couldn't simply, uh, we had more lines and you had you know, fewer outputs. So something has to decide which of those lines are getting output. I'm just gonna wait here for like 20 seconds. So you have a look at it. Where is the branch? It's the top there. There's one. Here? No, the, the other side. Branch. Oh, here? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just not. In the next slide, I'll talk about what this symbol means, okay? But say this is the output of the branch, so we decided either to go PC plus 4, which is not taking the branch, like carry on what the instruction was doing in the PC, or we take the branch. Which, which we say the branch was taken, and you go to the branch. So this, when it comes back to the PC, you, you have either a PC plus four or an address of a branch, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about this symbol in, in, in a few slides. Okay. So remember, all of these, all of these, uh, you know, uh, all the pain that we are um, sustaining is just 
the computers are only working in two different modes, right? Zero and one, low voltage, which represents zero, or one, which is the high voltage. So we need to just come up with every design that finally outputs something logic, either zero or one. Okay? So, within this paradigm, we have two different things. A, a combi combinational elements, which operates on data. We'll talk about it. We have examples. Or we have states or sequential elements, such as what the memory or registers are doing. And we use those for storing information. Right? So we're going to talk about those, those combi uh, combi uh, combinational elements or the states. Let's first talk about the combinational element. So that was your question as well. So we have four different things in our simple processor. So we are doing, and <clears throat> we are doing a, uh, we have a, we have a multiplexer. We have arithmetic or logic, or we have an adder, right? So this is how we show an AND gate, right? We call this gate. We show it this way. What it does is just gets two signals A and B and outputs as the end of those. So Y is A and B. So this is the ampersand representing uh, a logical end. Okay? If both of them were one, the output is one. This sort of ALU-like shape with the plus inside is what is called as a symbol, as an adder, right? So the Y would be simply the, the add of two input signals A and B. Okay? Another combinational elements that we talk about <coughs> is going to be the multiplexer. I, I mentioned it, so we, we show it as uh, MUX. So you have, in this case, you have two signals, I0 and I1, input 0 and input 1, and you want to decide which of them are going to get selected, either 0 or 1. And this is control what to select. Since you have only two signals, so with only one bit, you can select those, right? If this bit is 0, you're going to pick the first one. If the bit is 1, you're going to pick the, the second one. If you had four input signals, say if you had four, we needed to have two, right, two signals here to represent all those four input signals, okay? So depending on the number of input, you need to have another um, selector that matches the number of inputs here in a multiplexer. And finally, this one, the ALU one, just does the arithmetic or logic unit, right? We do something like F of A or B, A, A, A and B, so this, this could be different uh, depending on the, uh, the function that we were discussing. So these four are the, the combinational elements that we discuss here, okay? For the second part, the states or the sequential element that actually memory or registers are doing to store information, we need to make sure we have a convention that um, we specify exactly at what time we need to access those data. By access, I mean either reading or writing. Okay. For simplicity in this course and, and, and many other computer architecture course and actually the hardware, they use an edge triggered update. So this is your clock of your CPU, right? This is one period, right? Which is, this is one and this is zero, okay? So in one period you have one and a zero, right? You come here, there's one and then zero. So that's one period. The faster your CPU is, what's going to happen to that period? The faster the frequency of your CPU is. Like instead of a kilo, kilohertz, it's going to be a gigahertz, right? What's going to happen to that period? Is it going to get longer or shorter? Why shorter? <coughs> That's right, because period is, is the inverse of your frequency. So the faster your CPU is, what it does is actually finishes that clock faster, right? A million times per second for a, for a mega, or, a, or, or 10 to the raise of 9, so like giga per second. So you see that when you have a CPU of, I don't know, 2, two gigahertz, that's, that's, the, that's the amount of uh, 
that's the size of your period and that's that uh, this is small right so there our convention is we use a clock signal which is this we're going to have it as an input to determine when to update the stored value right so that's your d signal on the second line and that's the output which is the q right so you see when we use a, an edge triggered convention <coughs> The moment we output Q is when exactly we have on the edge of the clock. Okay? On every on every clock rate, on every period, you see? We're accessing it right here on the edge. So if everyone in a synchronous system use this convention, you, you won't have any issue with the uh, read or write um, problems. So some of them are, you'll learn more about it in other courses perhaps. So one of the more well-known one is raw read after write. So the issue is you have a variable like it's 20. Okay? So you want to access this at time zero. So if you if you at time zero you read it, it's gonna be twenty. Okay, the output is twenty. If at time zero minus one, a second before you were accessing this, somebody changes this, you still have the opportunity to see it on the next iteration as the updated value, right? But if after you read this as twenty, somebody comes and change it to two. Okay, somebody writes to this value as 2. And then you read it again, right? You're going to have an issue that this 20 is not equal to 2 anymore, right? This is a read after write issue. So you want to make sure when you read a value, you don't read it after some, someone else was writing to it, okay? Also, just like this, we have write after write and write after read issue. So these are three different classes of uh, issues when you're dealing with data. So if you have a convention such as edge trigger, in a synchronous um, processor, so you're, ma you're making sure that you're reading or writing data at the, at the right time, right? In the same convention that it should be done. Okay. So, on the case of so that was that was the read one, right? On the case of write, excluding the clock D and output, you have another write. <coughs> and a convention for write is only updates on clock H when write control input is one. So as long as this is one, you are able to write. Okay? And you see here, we only writing, we only putting the output here when the write was on. When the write is off, which is this, here represents zero for write, here represents one for write. Okay? The write is off on this clock, so there is no write being done to the output of Q. When write is on, which is on the on the top, right, we can write here. Is that clear what? Was that clear? Question? Yes or no? So, I know it's hard to just be the other at 6.15 when you had class all day, but it's, it's the same for all of us, you know. It's the same for me as well. So, so here you have four, four signals, right, that, that operates with the clock of your CPU. So when it is down, 
it means that it's zero, right? When it's up, it means that one. Just like for the clock of the CPU, that's your processor. You have one here, you have zero here. You have one here, you have zero here, okay? And this is your register with the write control. So whenever this write is set or it is one, you're able to write. So you need to follow this graph. Whenever this graph at, as, is at this location, which is the one value, you're able to write it. You see this, this, this red arrow? When this is zero, which is in this area, there is no write is done, okay? On the other case, for the, for the case that you didn't have a write input, you could have write every time there was a clock CPU because it was only working on edge trigger, right? At every edge, you could have write. But here, when we have a write control, as long as this is one, which is here and here only, on the case that write is one, you can write. On the case that write is zero, there's no way you can write, okay? <coughs> what is it? Most of them has to be one. Uh, as long as this right is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is logical. You can see that, yeah. All right. Just like what we discussed um, in the previous slides, the, the combinational logic transforms data during clock cycle and we mentioned that clock cycle we as a convention we just use the the trigger and the longest delay determines the clock period right mm -hmm. that was your period so we input something with the state element 1 and the state element two, so and, and, and you do something there, and it's gonna suppose uh, supposedly it should finish in one cycle. So you ex you expect that value to be output after that zero and one, which was the clock cycle of the period, right? So in general, a, a, a clock a clock period specif uh, specifies and checks timing between all synchronous elements within the uh, within your processor's clock. All right. Now we talked the. Now we talked about both. Um, combinational elements within that uh, logic design, and also the states elements for memory or registers, right? That are dealing with uh, storing information. Let's see how we're going to build a data path, okay? So we define a data path as elements that process, uh, process data and address in the CPU. So we want to process something, which, which is data, in the CPU, okay? So these things that are dealing with that uh, in data are obvious registers, ALU, multiplexer, and memories, right? So Incrementally, we are, we are trying to build a data path for RISC-5, okay? And we keep refining our <laughs> design. Okay. All right, so let's have a very simplified version of an instruction fetch. So, PC contains 64-bit registers, right? Which are the address that, that needs to be fetched. So the instruction memory need uh, only, you know, need, need only to be provided with the read access. Here we don't have any write. We don't have any write. So. We can just treat this block of design as just a combinational logic. And what it stands for is just the output at any time, right, reflects the content of the location. 
specified by the address input. We don't need to wait, have another uh, write equal to one set in order to do that. Okay, and in general, we don't need uh, to have a read control signal. Okay, so the other is an ALU wire. This always add is two sixty four bits and place the sum on its output. Okay. So that's a very small scale instruction fix for, for an add. So let, let's see something more. Sophisticated, if you, if you will. So first of all, why do we have all these fives here? So five stands for five line that comes into that, right? Why do we have those fives there? Can anyone suggest why we have <coughs> those five? So each of them represents five input signals. So this. So each of Why do we need five bits for each of those registers? So we have two read registers, one write register, and one write data. <coughs> Why we need those fives there? What is it? Uh, it, it could be different, that's why we have five. But why five? <coughs> Does anyone know? So you remember where we were talking about the, the addressing of R format and the other types. So we needed to, to have two registers, right? Some of them might be a write register, so we need a third one which has a write register. And for write register, we need to have a write data, right, to enable the writing, just like we discussed before. But why five? In risk five, how many registers we have? So these five lines of input, so is this is equal to just writing it this way. <coughs> right? To make it simple simple, we write it this way. So this so this is this accounts for one of those registers that we are needing either for a store or load, right? In the majority of the instructions, you needed two registers, right? Except the load. So that's why we need two registers, just like that. And for the case of write, we need another one to specify specify either of those 32 that we have access with the with this set. So using these five signals, either zero or one, how many options you have? Right? It's like Two options on the first one, two options on the second one, two <coughs> options on the third, fourth, and fifth. It's going to be 32, right? So with these five, you can represent 32 different options, right? And that's exactly choose, uh, chooses us the specific register number that we were trying to access, OK? Is that clear? <coughs> So, for the arithmetic instructions, we needed two registers. We, we knew this before from the chapter 2 and 3, right? So we need to have two registers, read register 1, read register 2. Either of those can be selected from the pool of those 32 that we have in RISC-5. Okay? For read, no other control input is needed. We don't, we don't need to control the read. But for write, we need to control the write. So this, is, this controls it. Right? This only controls this write register. Um, just like before, the writes are all edge triggered. So we know the writes are going to be done at the, at the the specific time 
which are at the edge of the, the, the CPU clock. And this way we make sure we can read and write at the same cycle, okay? The read will get the value written in an earlier clock cycle, while the value written will be um, available to a read in a subsequent clock cycle. So, this is for write and this is for read. And then we're going to have <coughs> the data values, right? They're all in 64. And the operation performed by the ALU is controlled with the ALU operational signal, which is this. That specifies, so here we have four, four signals, so we can specify 16 different operations done by this ALU, depending on the type of the signals that has been defined, okay? So that was for the case of R format, or arithmetic instructions. Yeah, you remember if for, for branches we might need that, right? Like if if um, so in for for ALU we can do some comparisons as well, right? The zero might output the right. So one of the ALU com could be an R, R, one of the arithmetic instructions could be output as zero, and zero could be in in one of the case of the sixteen that we are trying to represent is like. They were, to, they were equal or they were not equal, depending on the instruction, right? It gives us the flexibility to just, we are trying to design a processor that does many jobs, okay? With one design, we are trying to envision so many other things that we can do. We can add with that, we can, you know, do a sub with that, we can multiply with that, okay? And that's how your computer is doing this. You have one processor, but you do multiple jobs, okay? All right, let's see what, how the load or store instructions can be represented in a, in a logical way. So as I talked in some slides ago, the, the memory unit um, was, a, was a state element, right? With inputs for the address and write data, and a single output for the read results so in this case we have there are, we have separate read and write controls <coughs> for load and store um, although we have to mention that the uh, only one of these may be uh, may be controlled at, at, at a time okay so one of them might be asserted on a given clock And this immediate, this IM gen, right, has 32-bit instructions as input and selects a 12-bit field for load, right, store and branch if equal. So using that, it's going to select either it was load, store, or branch. And then the reason why it outputs, it, uh, outputs uh, this in 64 is because it's going to sign extend it into a 64 bit, right? Okay. Just before, just like before, we assume that all the writes are um, at edge triggered, right? All right, we saw what the R format or arithmetic instructions were. We saw what the load and store instructions could be. Let's just wrap up uh, with the branch instructions. 
right? The branch instructions uh, could read registers operand, compare operands. They, they're going to use ALU again, subtract and check zero output, right? That was your question. And it calculates the target address, so in sign extend displacement, <coughs> and it's going to shift left and add to PC value. So the PC will know either it's going to be plus four or the branch address itself. So let's see an example of how we're going to compute, for instance, branch not equal uh, BEQ of X1 and X2 and go to specific offset, right? So to implement this instruction, uh, we must first compute the branch target address by adding the sign extended offset, right? Here. So this shifting left by one um, is actually a routing of the signals between input and output that adds zero of two to the lower order, right? It's going to add a zero to the lower side. And that's what it represents. It just reroutes the wires, okay? That's why it, 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 it's as if that you're shifting it to the left. Um, since we know that the, the offset was sign extended, right, from 12 bits, the shift will throw away only sign bits. Because we have, we have started from this and we end up 64, so if we shift left, it's going to just throw away the sign bit, right? And a control logic Uh, it's going to use here to decide whether the uh, whether we increment the branch, uh, whether we increment the PC program counter or branch to the target address, based on the zero output of the ALU. Right, if it was zero, the branch is taken to branch the logical address. If it wasn't, so we have two options here in the output: either PC plus four, or go to offset right which is branch taken or not taken this is not taken NT All right, uh, I'm going to stop here and we carry on on Wednesday. Okay, so see you guys in the lab.